Hi, I'm Darren Dooley, and this is our video on CSM best practices. Today, we're going to be looking at customer success management best practices and really understand what are the processes that vendors are employing to create such a great uh, experience for providers. How we've done that is we've asked over 65 vendors uh, what, is, what are some of the processes that you've employed to have such a great CSM program. And then we paired that up with our data from providers. And so we can really understand and look at who is performing well, as well as understand what are they doing to have that high performance. So historically, we've, we present this slide very frequently in our, in our deep dives. And what we're communicating is that customer success comes from great, great relationships paired with good technology. And what we wanted to understand as we dove into this, de this data is, is really figuring out like what does that great relationship look like and why do you need that relationship? And just short answer, you need that relationship in case something goes wrong or understanding the customer's journey and feeding that back into your development team. So what we see often when providers will leave a, a vendor solution is when they have an issue, something breaks, and they go to first line support and they're not necessarily getting their problem solved. And so it creates this frustration loop where something, something breaks and nobody is listening to me inside the vendor's software. And so when we look at this and we, and we try to understand, okay, what are the processes in place that vendors have, have utilized to really create that relationship? That's what this data is. It really just shows us this, this is how it's done. And Understanding both the vendor and the provider perspective, we paired our data together and figured out, okay, what's most correlated when we look at comments around uh, the provider perspective with a great relationship? So first, we want to cover how class determine high-performing CSM programs. We first looked at the provider's perspective and tallied up what is the proportion of positive comments around CSMs and then correlated that with our internal data on metrics. And what we found is the most correlated metrics with high performing or strong CSM programs are executive involvement, quality of phone and web support, and proactive service. And this is no surprise. Intuitively, we've thought this all along, but now we have the data to go from I think to I know. And so we know that these three metrics are very correlated with a strong or high performing CSM program. The fourth metric you can see is the likely to recommend. And this one is a very key metric in understanding what does growth look like for a software vendor. And so we understand from this data that having a high relationship or a strong relationship with the provider equals uh, growth in the long run. They're, they're much more likely to recommend your software solution to other providers if you have a strong relationship with them. And what we found to be, when we looked at all the questions that we asked the vendors, and what we found is the most correlated behavior with CSM success is training, sales incentives, and empowerment. And what we found with that is we can get really detailed in what each one of these segments look like. But what's really interesting here is when you pair it with the most common complaints around CSM programs. So when we asked the providers historically, and we look at all the things that they said negatively around CSM, we found the three things that come up the most are inexperience, turnover, and availability. And when you match that with what the vendors have said and, and figuring out, okay, how does this combat those three negative pitfalls? it really starts to make sense. So training, how much and what kind of training is predicted of CSM success? We found that eight to 12 weeks of formal training program with ample job shadowing leads to highest success. And what that combats is that complaint around inexperience. And then sales incentives. So this is something that's new to class. Historically, we've always pushed that CSMs should not be in sales. And why we push that is from the provider's perspective, when you hear a lot of negative comments around that sales, they'll say something to the effect of, you know, we never hear from our CSM unless they're trying to sell us something. And so we've come out very strongly historically saying CSMs should not be sales, they are support, so have them focus on support. 
But what we find is that CSMs used in the right way can be very effective in the sales process. And we'll get more on that later. The last piece is empowerment. This is a very broad term and we realized um, when we asked vendors, uh, are your CSMs empowered, yes or no? All of them answered yes. And then they would go on to describe empowerment. And a lot of times it wasn't necessarily empowerment. It would be more like, well, our CSMs can call or reach out or email whenever they would like. And that's not necessarily empowerment. So we're gonna define empowerment better and help you understand what, what that looks like. So again, remember, as we go through this, these are the three things that we're trying to combat as, as complaints around the CSM program. And going into training, empowerment, and sales will, re will really help you understand what's happening there. What it really comes down to as we went into this data is we were trying to find really specific use cases of, of what really made a great CSM program. And one of the vendors came out and said this, it's a lot more about right fit, right person, good partnership than it is about ancillary facts. And this is so true. When we look at supporting data from other sectors that class has done, specifically with consulting, we find the top two reasons why providers replace consultants is first, technical capabilities, and second, culture fit. So when you're, when you're figuring out, okay, how do we assign CSMs to customers? You really need to think through, is this person the right culture fit? And this is what we find in the data as well, is, is how important that culture piece is to matching up with the success of the customer. Now looking specifically at the data and the results of having a strong CSM versus a weak CSM, we see a big difference in the percentage of, of customers that would recommend them. Now let me define the weak CSM versus a strong CSM. So on the weak CSM, how we group that up is we had the 65 vendors that participated and we scored them based on those three metrics, the proactive service, customer support, as well as executive involvement. And if they scored in the bottom 15, we categorize them as a weak CSM. And if they scored in the top 15, we categorize them as a strong CSM. And we find if you have a strong CSM program, there's a 91% chance that the customers would recommend versus a 76% chance that they would recommend if you had a weak CSM program. So almost 25% of your customers saying we wouldn't recommend if the CSM program is weak. Now, Something I want to point out here is we don't have a baseline. There's a lot of vendors in healthcare IT that don't have a CSM program. So we don't have that number that shows you how important it is just flipping on that CSM program. Looking at another very important metric is the would you buy again question. We like to use this one to refer to retention as would you buy again is a leading indicator of whether that customer is going to stay with your software solution or not. We find there is a 15% difference between that strong top 15 CSM vendors and the bottom 15% vendors. So the likelihood that they would buy again if there's a strong CSM program is 96% versus 80%. And it really just outlines the importance of why having a strong CSM program impacts the not only the retention, but the growth of your customers. So diving into the sales process, and this is really fascinating. So what we have here is a graph of all the vendors that participated. Each one of the vertical bars you see is a vendor. And we've color coded it by metric. So if they have a metric that's tied to revenue or growth, and this is not retention, this is, this is sales specific revenue or growth, we've highlighted in green. And you can see a high proportion of the top performers here are highlighted in green. And what the metric on the side, the CSM metric is, is going back to those three correlated, most correlated uh, metrics that we use. So those are the average of executive involvement, quality of support, and proactive service. And you can see here that a lot of the high performing vendors have that revenue and growth tied into their CSM metrics. But it's really important to understand that you do it right or you do it correctly. So an incorrect way of, of perceiving this data is we can give a high sales quota to all of our CSMs. When we dove into the comments and really understand what exactly are these vendors doing, we find that they're using 
the CSM more as a sales funnel. And so really you start to understand the purpose of the CSM. So the purpose of the CSM is to understand and be the advocate of the customer, really understand the customer journey. And if they understand that customer journey, they can introduce sales or a sales functionality or something that really benefits that customer throughout the process. So they can look at that customer and say, you know what, customer A would do really well if we introduced some of this functionality, but you know, they're not quite right. They're not quite ready yet. They're still figuring out functionality A. And so let's wait a month and then I'm gonna bring in the sales team and, and we're gonna make the sale or they'll do the sale themselves. And what we find is this is a really effective way to not only improve sales, but improve the customer experience. And it really goes back into, you know, are, we, are you doing it the right way? The fear here is if you over incentivize your CSMs to sell, they're gonna stop supporting. They're only gonna focus on their customers that are high revenue outputting or, or have that potential to, to increase the sales. And they're gonna ignore the little guy that maybe is just struggling with the product and doesn't really have the potential to grow as much as a, a higher value client. And so you really need to find that balance of how do we incentivize these CSMs but not over incentivize them where they only focus on the sales piece. Some other supporting metrics here is the nickel and dime metric. And again, you see the same occurrence where if sales are done right, customers don't feel nickel and dimed. And that's a really important metric to focus on because it's showing the value of the experience that the customers are, are having. And if you can tee up your solution as this is going to help you reach your goals rather than every time you call, they call or you call, you're just pitching them, uh, that changes the relationship dramatically. I think one important thing to, to mention here is that customer journey. If they're struggling or having some severe issues with the product and you're trying to upsell them, it builds a lot of frustration. And so you wanna be cautious on how you proceed with the sales with the CSM. The next interesting fact that we have on this sales perspective is that we find with, with CSMs that have a metric tied to sales and revenue growth, generally get paid more. So we have data that's showing just the base salary. So this doesn't include uh, financial incentives for closing a deal, but it just shows you, okay, with, with CSMs that have a sales or revenue metric, generally have a higher ceiling of how much they can make. So they're being incentivized to stick around which goes back to our, one of our main findings for issues that providers have, which is turnover. And so if you can raise that salary ceiling, as well as incentivize a CSM to, to actually have some skin in the game, we've, we find that they're gonna stick around longer and they're gonna have a lower turnover rate. So to summarize that whole section with some guidelines for sales within a CSM role, is keep it low pressure. Uh, you wanna incentivize, you you don't want to punish or have such a crazy high quota that your CSM is only focused on the sales piece because again, they'll start ignoring their low revenue, low potential customers. The second is this, this works really well because it gives them a career path. It gives them an opportunity to make more money uh, down the road and this lowers turnover for a CSM. The third is keeping it service culture. So again, the CSM is support, not sales. And we wanna make sure that we avoid uh, conversations where the providers say they only reach out to us if they wanna sell us something. So first support and then sales. Another metric that we asked is, do you sign by region, yes or no? And what we found is that in general, on average, when a vendor is assigning a CSM by region, they typically score lower than if they don't. And I wanna cover some of the reasons why we see that. But first I wanna show you the distribution of vendors on if they're assigned by region or not. And so you can see in this one, if they're assigned by region, they're a gray bar. And if they're not, it's a blue bar. And you see this wide variance of where, <laughs> where these metrics are falling. So we have one on, on the far right that is assigned by a region, but the majority are on, that, on the left side of this distribution. So scoring lower on that CSM metric. And why we see that, so when we look specifically at these vendors and what they're doing and why they've decided to use a region or not, 
using in a region and, and what works, we see these responses. So why vendors do not assign by region? The first is balance the workload. So in order to balance their workload, we have tiered our clients and we rank them by number of service and revenue. Every person has a good mix, so they have a balanced workload. The second part is match the CSM experience to customers' needs. We found that our model is more based on providing the right match in terms of level of experience and time commitment based on the type of client it is. And then when we looked at that chart and it showed the one on the far right of why assigned by region works, this vendor said, what we have tried and successfully done is match our roles to match our sales regions with where our CSMs live or if they are close to a good airport that will get them to their area quickly. So this makes a lot of sense when you're growing that relationship, having the face-to-face -face contact. Now I'm gonna turn uh, the presentation over to my colleague, Molly, who's gonna dive into the training portion of this research. Another key finding is that the type and amount of training that a CSM receives is highly predictive of their success. The highest performing vendors train their CSMs between 8 and 12 weeks, with 12 weeks being the most frequently reported. And you can see from the data here that the lowest performing vendors either offer no training or less than 4 weeks. And it's interesting that there is a point of diminishing returns here where some of the, hi the highest and the lowest performing vendors train their CSMs for 16 or more weeks. Not only do we see the impact of this on that CSM metric, but vendors who have these eight to 12 week training programs have customers that are more likely to recommend them and are more likely to buy again. Here's an example of what this sounds like when the vendor describes it. So this vendor describes the certification process that they have. They describe using an LMS for structured courses for their CSMs, and they talk about a structured shadowing program. As we looked through all of the comments and all of the responses and descriptions around how vendors approach training, we were able to categorize that into four different levels or these four different approaches, everything from basic to expert. And you can see that the expert level really does have the most structure and the most accountability for the training. We see that eight to 12 weeks, we see certification being required before engaging with customers and having clear and thorough materials to reference for self-training, as well as that structured shadowing of a senior CSM. Diving deeper, we found that these principles stood out and seemed to be impactful to the success of these programs. The formal training component should contain not only product training so that the CSM has deep knowledge of the product, but also training for specific CSM job responsibilities on top of the general onboarding for working at the company. Also that job shadowing should be very structured and very thorough where a senior CSM and the more junior or less experienced CSM spend around 30 days, or that was what was most commonly reported, really joined at the hip and really learning and understanding what the job entails. And that senior CSM should function as a coach and provide feedback as the junior CSM is taking on responsibilities. Another really important piece to this that we think some vendors often miss is having really cl strong client-focused training. So not only is the CSM learning about the product, learning about the job responsibilities of being a CSM, but there needs to be really structured um, training and transition to the new accounts. That CSM needs to have a clear understanding of the needs of the client and the organization and start making connections with the key stakeholders at each of those accounts. Now, part of why that's important is because as they go into that relationship and start having ongoing and regular meetings with their client, what we have found is that CSM programs or vendors that perform highly here that are very successful approach their meetings very strategically, which requires that deep knowledge and understanding of the client's goals and what their current status with the product is. So one of the questions that we also asked in this research was around what do you do for meetings? What do you see or what do you use as the best practices for those meetings with your customers? And similar to what Darren shared earlier, and you'll see the same quote here on the slide, is that the best practices are those that provide value for your customers. And that might look slightly different for each customer. And so having that deep knowledge of them and their goals is important for those meetings. <laughs> 
This view of the data shows us which vendors have a more strategic focus in their customer meetings. And the orange bars are not necessarily those that don't have that focus, but they didn't mention it when we asked them, what do you do or what do you see as best practices in these meetings? So those that spend time discussing the value the solution is providing and how it's helping the customer meet their own goals do score higher on average than those that did not mention it to us. So not only do we see that impact on their overall class score, but that strategic focus has an impact positively on that CSM metric that Darren mentioned, the overall satisfaction of the customer, and their likelihood to recommend you. So here's a look at a vendor who describes what that looks like. They mentioned that they have to know what success looks like to their client and that they structure the agenda and the focus of the meeting around that. They take an organized approach with their agendas, their deliverables, and who is in the meeting, with the foundation of that being that deep understanding of who the customer is and what's important to them. Now, as we looked at the totality of the commentary around this question and what vendors do in these meetings, um, these are some practices that stood out for what they do before the meetings happen, during the meetings, and then after the meetings. And we'll dive into a little more detail around each of these with some comments from vendors to get an idea and an understanding of what that looks like. So before the meeting, there is collaboration with customers on the agenda, on the objectives, and the attendance of the meeting or who's going to be in the meeting. During the meeting, there's some sort of health check um, and then discussion around the customer's strategic goals, the value that the solution is bringing to them, and how they can continue to work towards meeting those goals. And then after the meeting, it was interesting to hear from the vendors who have a clear post-meeting process in place um, to help make sure that they are capturing the important things that happened in those meetings. So let's talk a little bit about the before meeting practices that stood out. So collaborating before the meeting. Nearly everyone that we spoke to mentioned that they have an agenda. They use an agenda to drive the meeting. What was interesting is that nine respondents mentioned going a step further in that where they are collaborating beforehand on what the agenda is and what the content of that meeting is going to be to ensure that it's valuable and to make sure that expectations are being met. In addition, we have 10 respondents who mentioned that they specifically do what they can to ensure that the right people are attending the meeting, both from the customer side and from the vendor side. So if there's particular things that need to be covered in that month's or that quarter's meeting, where maybe they need to bring in someone from the product development team or they bring in somebody from sales, making sure that you're collaborating beforehand to know who those people need to be and so that you're meeting those objectives in advance or meeting those objectives and collaborating on that in advance. Um, you can see we, we have a couple of vendors here who mentioned that where they say attendance is a big thing. We get cross-functional attendance on both sides and we send out that agenda at least 48 hours in advance and sometimes they even send out the slides in advance so that everyone knows what to expect. As we looked at all of the descriptions that vendors gave us for what they do or what they consider best practices for their customer meetings, there were definitely some things that stood out for what vendors do before, during, and after these meetings. Nearly everybody that we spoke to mentioned that they have some kind of agenda to drive the meeting, but we have nine respondents who mentioned that they go a step further in collaborating on that agenda with the customer before the meeting to ensure that the meeting is valuable and that they're meeting all of their customers' expectations. Additionally, we had 10 respondents mention that they specifically do what they can to ensure that the right people are in attendance, both from their side on the vendor and then also from the customer side and aligning on those meeting objectives and agenda in advance is the effective or most effective way to make sure that the important stakeholders are known and then invited to those meetings. Nearly half of the respondents mentioned that they have some kind of scorecard, dashboard, or data that they review with their customers as kind of a health check to get an understanding of current utilization, current issues, and where they're at currently on strategic outcomes and goals. And then they'll follow up those um, kind of health check discussions with recommendations for solutions or optimization. Also in those meetings, they really, um, beyond that data review, 
one third of our respondents say that they go into that meeting with a really clear understanding of what their customer priorities are. And they're reviewing the outcomes in relation to the value that the customers are expecting to get and understanding the value that they are getting. They know it's important to their customers and they have more strategic discussions around those goals and what they expect to get to in the future. Seven of the vendors that spoke with us mentioned that they have some kind of clear process and timelines for following up on action items and ownership of priorities after the meeting. Additionally, a few mentioned that they have their own internal metrics that they collect to help them gauge the success of the meeting, where the client is at in their level of engagement, and really just the overall health of the relationship. Effective customer meetings is just one way that the CSM has an impact on the customer relationship and the overall success of the customer with the product. I'm gonna turn the time over now to Rebecca to walk us through our findings around CSM empowerment. Hi, I'm Rebecca Hammond, and I'm going to walk you through our findings around empowered CSM programs. It was an interesting question to ask because we asked vendors to tell us what activities are their CSMs empowered to carry out. And the most common response was that CSMs are empowered to communicate with their client and they can internally escalate problems. These were things like holding quarterly calls and coordinating meetings and really working with their customers to possibly communicate value, potentially outcomes that they're seeing, and also upselling. However, there were a select few in the data that went beyond some of those job responsibilities that we know are critical to the CSM role. Some of these programs mentioned things that really got to the core of decision making and who owned the decision making. And so these truly empowered CSM programs put the decision making in the hands of their CSMs. They were trained and experienced and knowledgeable CSMs, and therefore they were capable of making decisions without needing to internally escalate those problems, which ultimately slows down the problem resolution and value that the customers might see. So as we take a closer look at this data, you'll see in the blue, these are the vendors that have empowered CSM programs. There is a seven point difference in overall class score between vendors that have empowered CSM programs and vendors that do not. And the interesting thing is when we look at this by metric, you'll notice that, that there are some critical gaps that we're seeing between those empowered CSMs and those that are not. While some of these are part of that CSM metric that Darren mentioned earlier, executive involvement, phone and web support, and proactive service, we're also seeing some other critical gaps here that were pretty interesting. One was around the quality of implementation and another was around delivery of new technology. And the interesting thing about both of those metrics is that delivery of new technology is a strong predictor of future retention and sales with your customers. And quality of implementation is a future predictor of long-term satisfaction that your customers will have with your product. And so we're seeing that having an empowered CSM program really helps move the needle on some of these critical metrics that we track. The other interesting thing that we saw as we looked at the difference between these vendors was that there were clear gaps between those metrics that were most correlated with the overall CS CSM program strength. So you'll notice things like loyalty and retention are stronger among those that have a empowered CSM program you'll see a better perception from these customers around feeling nickel and dimed. And you'll also see a better perception from these customers that they feel as though their vendor is keeping their promises. So to give you a sense of what some of these activities sound like, you'll notice that empowered CSMs have the ability to travel at their discretion, to move their calendar around to best meet the needs of their customers on a dime, and be able to allocate training hours, or refunds should that be necessary without needing further approval from anyone higher up in the chain of command at the organization. Again, this allows CSMs to really serve their customers effectively and quickly. In order for a CSM to really be empowered, they do need to have excellent training. They have to have a deep knowledge of the customer's organizational goals, and that allows them to really take care of those customers. So as you are wondering, how can I make my CSM program more empowered so that we can better serve our customers? 
You want to be thinking about setting up a governance structure that helps manage the relationship, putting in particular guardrails that allows your CSMs to really have the empowerment to make these decisions at the front line rather than looking for approval internally. That also means that these CSMs really do need to deeply understand their customers and their unique goals. That could also mean that they should be able to travel at their own discretion or offer free refunds without approval. Additionally, your CSMs will want to be able to identify those areas where there are new opportunities that can address your customer needs rather than just waiting to react to those customers. And ultimately, keeping your promises around development and timeline is critical to driving success with your customers. The thing to understand here is what empowered CSMs are not. Because there was a disconnect, most vendors believe that they do have empowered CSMs, but some of these are simply just critical CSM job responsibilities that don't take into the difference between a job responsibility and an empowered CSM. So those are things like answering support questions, tracking customer success, not having any input on charges or fees to the customers, and not really understanding the customer's organizational goals and being able to drive value, have conversations around what outcomes they're seeing, and be able to help them move the needle critically. We asked a number of questions when we spoke to vendor organizations about their customer success management programs. And really, the three critical pieces that came out of this were those sale incentives, training, and empowered CSM programs. However, we were curious and we did look at a multitude of other questions that we asked. One was really around revenue, and this was interesting as we took a closer look at that CSM metric and how these vendors were performing. We noticed that those companies that have really high revenue generally have a lower performing CSM program. Now, this really isn't surprising to us because you do have that large enterprise vendor effect that's taking place here where you have much more complex organizations and it just is more difficult to be able to maintain that really strong relationship with your customers. But we do see that there are enterprise vendors that are having success and one of the most successful enterprise vendors here does have a very empowered CSM program. The other question that we received very frequently was, what is the magic number? What is that ratio that our CSMs should have in terms of supporting our customer base? And there wasn't strong correlation in terms of customer satisfaction and the number or ratio that the CSM program had. However, we did see that the most frequently reported ratio was about eight to 12 clients per CSM. This is such a common question, and so of course we wanted to touch on it, but we also looked at many other questions that, while not strongly correlated, can offer some greater insight, which we would be happy to share with you. If you would like more information about this data and about how you can help improve your CSM program or get a non-existent CSM program off the ground successfully, please reach out to your class representative and we would be happy to share more information. If you would like to be included in a future round of vendor-focused research as we look deeply at what drives success for customers, please reach out to us. We will continue to do these studies over the course of the next year.